three years after coming to power in Germany, Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party are spreading fear throughout Europe. Litauen, Estland, Norwegen, Sweden, Denmark, Niederlande, Belgien, Großbritannien, Irland, Frankreich, Portugal, Spanien, die Schweiz, Liechtenstein, Luxemburg, Polen. And it's not just overseas where extremism is on the rise. In the U.S., where the depression still wreaks havoc on the economy, black Americans face twin evils, the segregation born of blatant racism, and in some places, another evil. I grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I lived right downtown in a working class neighborhood with an Irish grocery store on one corner, an Italian bar on another, and the Nazi party was on the third corner. It was 1936 when my daddy gave me the talk. <laughs> and we were walking by the Nazi party headquarters. They were Highland Hitler. And he said, these people are white supremacists. They think they're better than anybody else. But that's, that's a sickness. And you don't get angry with sick people. He took me to a segregated movie to see Jesse Owens in the 36 Olympics. Jesse won the 100 meter dash, and Hitler refused to give him his medal. Instead, he walked out of the stadium in anger and took all of the black shirt Nazis with him. Jesse didn't worry about that. He stayed cool. He just went on and won three more gold medals. By 1940, certain that conflict is inevitable, the US begins ramping up to support the war effort. The War Department was spending billions and billions of dollars on new airplanes, new tanks, in an effort to prepare for what they thought was coming. And so that meant a lot of jobs for a lot of people. And that's actually what brought the country out of the Great Depression. But African Americans saw themselves being left behind in that and began agitating and organizing uh, to make sure that they were given equal opportunity in those hiring decisions. In September 1939, Great Britain and France declare war on Germany. One year later, the U.S. launches its first peacetime draft. All men between the ages of 21 and 35, regardless of race, are required to register. Among them is Charles McGee from Cleveland, Ohio. Just 20 years old, he is eager to serve his country, and he wants to fly. And I learned about the program because of the now called Tuskegee Airmen. The first were the mechanics. The policy of the Army at the time was saying that they couldn't use a black pilot because there were no black mechanics. In other words, they insisted on segregation. The same year, under pressure from the NAACP, President Roosevelt orders the Army Air Corps to begin training black pilots in Alabama at Tuskegee Institute, made famous by Booker T. Washington. They will receive a college education during their training, paid for by the government. But it will not be easy. The way I heard about the Tuskegee Airmen program, I was learning to fly here in Colorado Springs, and uh, was the flight magazine came out with an article about Tuskegee and the flight program. You can go to college and learn to fly, and the government will pay for it. And so they set me up for that program. By the end of 1940, young black men from all over the country make their way to Tuskegee for training. I was drafted. I got the train heading to Fort Meade, Maryland. Got to Washington, D.C., had a two-hour layover, came back to get on the train. And he says, no, you ride in the car where Negroes ride. Welcome to the South. 
it was as prevalent down the South. You just knew it. That's a, they knew they had their side and you had your side. Well, as long as you were on the campus of Tuskegee Airfield, it was okay. But it's when you went to town, you know, they had big signs, whites here, blacks here, and all, all that sort of thing. I didn't know I couldn't go into certain restaurants, or uh, I never paid any mind. Fortunately, we had classmates who let us know you don't go to this part of town to buy gas. And fortunately, we stayed out. Our focus was in the training and so on, so there was very limited um, activity in the town, even in the training. It occurred to me that, well, why is the military like this? You know, but I didn't pay any money. I want to fly, so I said I'd put up with a lot of stuff. To... On behalf of the United States Army, the reception center here at this camp, we're glad to welcome you here today and into the United States Army. Oh, right flank. Oh, yep. Oh. Even so, the young airmen soon learned that not everyone welcomed them, even on the air base. We were trained by uh, black instructors. Their job was twofold. One, teach us to fly, and secondly, to condition us for the white instructors that we would have in basic in advance, where they would get in our face, call us names, all kinds of things to wash us out. So they didn't believe in the program, and they thought it was a waste of time and money. During that period of time, the washout or failure rate for white cadets was running at 63%. The first class that went through Tuskegee, the washout rate was 40%. And they says, no, 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 no. This will never happen again. So made, they made sure they had a washout rate of 73% or higher, 10% higher than the white cadets. That's why we only graduated in 996. We were really fighting something that had been started back when the Army War College did a study in 1925 claiming that physically we were qualified to serve our country, mentally, morally, and otherwise inferior uh, to the white man, therefore no service in a technical area such as maintaining flying airplane would even be possible. Flying training program was designed for our failure. They didn't want any black pilots, period. General Hap Arnold didn't want any blacks in his white air force. So everything was against us. We had to go through a lot, a lot of injustices. We lost a lot of good pilots. By March, 1941, the Tuskegee program faced financial trouble. Help came from First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. She traveled to Tuskegee and flew with instructor Charles Alfred Anderson. It was quite a deal because the person she flew with was Charles Alfred Anderson. He became the chief instructor for us. Then, in early 1941, the 99th Pursuit Squadron was established. One day, this squadron will become part of the unit known as the Tuskegee Airmen. My father, Colonel Lawrence E. Roberts, would be one of them. He would one day tell me he'd never known such freedom as a black man as he felt flying a plane. These men were pioneers of a venture so new that you who stand here before me now, after three years, may still be considered forerunners in the movement which has given you a place in the fighting men of the sky. No thought at the time that uh, we we're going to go down Tuskegee and set the world on fire. We were just happy to be able to take part and for many do something that they had wanted to do, and that's fly an airplane. 